Wildlife Heritage Foundation of Wyoming was incorporated April 20, 2000, as an independent, apolitical, nonprofit corporation recognized by the IRS as a 501c3 organization on May 26, 2005. The foundation is eligible to receive tax deductible contributions. The foundation's purpose is to provide financial support through philanthropy to critical wildlife conservation efforts in Wyoming. Its mission is to create an enduring natural legacy for future generations through stewardship of all Wyoming's wildlife. The Wildlife Heritage Foundation promotes the conservation of Wyoming's rich wildlife resources and wildlife habitat funding projects in these areas, species conservation, habitat enhancement, and conservation education. It developed the idea for the Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame in 2003. It is the Foundation's annual signature event. The primary purpose of the Hall of Fame is to honor those individuals both living and posthumously who have made significant, lasting lifetime contributions to the conservation of Wyoming's outdoor heritage. Each year, recognition will be given to people who have worked consistently over many years to conserve Wyoming's natural resources through volunteer service, environmental restoration, educational activities, visual and written media, the arts, and political and individual leadership. Another goal of the Hall of Fame is to educate the public about and promote the significance of Wyoming's rich outdoor heritage. Inductees will be solid role models for today's youth. The Foundation is pleased to announce that the Outdoor Wall of Fame will be hosted by the Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody, Wyoming. 2005 Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame inductee, George Bird Grinnell. George Bird Grinnell was born in Brooklyn in 1849. When he was about eight years old, his family moved to Audubon Park, where the widow of John James Audubon ran a small elementary school which the young George attended. This childhood contact with the Audubons kindled a lifelong interest in natural history and conservation. In 1870, he volunteered to go to Nebraska, Wyoming, and Utah on a collecting expedition with the paleontologist Othniel Marsh. He returned to the plains in 1872, accompanied the Custer expedition to South Dakota's Black Hills in 1874, served as chief naturalist on the Ludlow expedition to Yellowstone Park in 1875, and made several other western hunting trips between 1876 and 1880. In 1883, Grinnell bought a ranch in Wyoming's Shirley Basin. In 1880, he took over the editorship of Forest and Stream, a sporting publication that, under Grinnell's leadership, became the leading voice for conservation of big game and wild land in America. In 1881, he took up the fight to preserve the remnants of the bison and, in 1882, began a campaign to protect Yellowstone's wildlife that ended with the passage of the Yellowstone Park Protection Act in 1894. At about the same time, Grinnell began a drive to end spring shooting of waterfowl, an effort that culminated in the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918. In 1884, Grinnell called for an association of men bound together by their interest in game and fish, a suggestion that led to the formation of the Boone and Crockett Club, a major force in early conservation. Grinnell worked behind the scenes, as he so often did, serving as a member of the executive committee. In 1886, he organized the National Audubon Society. Inspired by Grinnell's strong views on the sale of wild game and plumes, his close friend, John Lacey, introduced a bill that supported state game laws by making the interstate shipment of illegally killed game a violation of federal statute. The Lacey Act is still a crucial part of American conservation. Grinnell was a stalwart in the struggle to protect the nation's forests, advocating a government system of forest conservation as early as 1883, an idea that led to the establishment of our national forests. He championed the idea of protecting Glacier National Park. An avid hunter and angler, he was one of the most influential advocates of sportsmanship and ethics in the blood sports. When he died in 1938, 
The New York Times remembered him as the father of American conservation. Two thousand five Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame inductee Paul Petzold, born in nineteen o eight, Paul Petzold faced difficult times as a child. His family lost its Iowa farm and moved to Twin Falls, Idaho, when Paul was eleven. He began his climbing career in the rock bluffs overlooking the Snake River near Twin Falls. At sixteen, he climbed the Grand Teton with a friend. They were only the fourth party to make the ascent. The adventure led him to other climbs in North and South America, Europe, and Asia. Guiding tourists in the Tetons, he developed new techniques for safe climbing, many of which he refined during his service with the Tenth Mountain Division in World War II. In 1961, Petzold launched a climbing school in Lander, Wyoming. At about the same time, he testified in favor of the Wilderness Act, which became federal law in 1964. The creation of the wilderness system fueled a growing interest in the American backcountry. Thousands of people flocked to the wilderness with great enthusiasm and remarkably little training. Petzold saw both the interest and the lack of experience, and decided to open a school of his own. The National Outdoor Leadership School opened for business in Lander in the summer of 1965. The classes spent a month in the Wind River Range, backpacking, climbing, fishing, and botanizing. Petzold and his colleagues emphasized the need to minimize the impact of wilderness activities. The basic thing to remember is to camp and pass through an area and leave no trace of your being there. He told the students. The school and its charismatic leader rapidly gained an international reputation. More than seventy-five thousand people have been through Knowles courses, learning backcountry techniques, and at the same time, a reverence for the backcountry itself. Not satisfied with this contribution to ethical outdoor recreation, Petzold launched an even broader program, the Wilderness Education Association. Beginning in 1977, the association built a curriculum that stresses low-impact use of the backcountry. In 1984, at the age of 86, Petzold climbed to the moraine of Middle Teton Glacier at an altitude of 11,000 feet on the Grand Teton. Handicapped by his vision, he had lost most of his eyesight to glaucoma. He called a halt. "I've been teaching judgment for 60 years," he said. "I was afraid if I tried the final pitch, I'd step on a rock that wasn't there." He came back down to the valleys unbowed. In 1991, he died at the age of 91. 2005 Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame inductee James R. Simon. Jim Simon was born in North Platte, Nebraska, in 1908, and moved to Riverton, Wyoming, with his family when he was 10. He became an amateur naturalist while in his teens. And decided to pursue a degree in zoology. Studying under Dr. John Scott at the University of Wyoming, he obtained a master's degree. Then stayed on to teach zoology for two years. In 1936, Jim took an assignment as a ranger and naturalist in Yellowstone National Park, where he studied distribution of fish species in the park, and published his book Yellowstone Fishes. In 1937. Dr. Scott appointed Jim as Wyoming State Fish Commissioner and State Fish Warden. Jim undertook a complete inventory of Wyoming fishes and disposed of several obsolete hatcheries. With the outbreak of World War II, Jim joined the Navy and served in the Pacific Theater, leaving naval service with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. After the war, he returned to Wyoming and the Game and Fish Department, where he published his definitive Wyoming Fishes in 1946. Jim had honed his skills with both still and motion picture equipment, and upon his return to Wyoming, he began filming wildlife. One of his first film productions, Wyoming's Big Game, revealed his artistic talent and his eye for photographing wildlife. In 1947, he became director of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Park and the New York Zoological Society's field station near Moran, where he perfected his filmmaking skills. And his work soon came to the attention of Walt Disney. 
Disney later offered Jim a contract as field director and cinematographer. His Vanishing Prairie and The Living Desert both won Academy Awards, as did Bear Country, Waterbirds, and White Wilderness. His Jaguar documentary, Jungle Cat, won Filmdom's Famous Fives Award. Following an African expedition to produce a documentary for the New York Zoological Society, Jim brought his family back to Wyoming. He was hired as Special Projects Director by the Wyoming Travel Commission and immediately created a series of publications and television spots promoting Wyoming's outdoors. In 1971, Jim received the prestigious National Press Photographers Association Television News Film Award. Jim Simon's life would be cut short by lung cancer in 1973. In a personal note a year before his death, Wyoming Senator Clifford Hansen wrote to Jim, Few people have done more unusual things than you, and fewer still have contributed so much to a state and nation. 2005 Wyoming Outdoor Hall of Fame inductees, Dr. Elizabeth Beth Williams, and Dr. E. Tom Thorne. Beth Williams earned her DVM at Purdue University in 1977. While working on her PhD in veterinary pathology at Colorado State University, Beth earned fame for providing the first scientific description of chronic wasting disease and continued to be a leading expert on CWD throughout her career. She was involved in many wildlife organizations and was frequently recognized for her accomplishments. She served on United Nations, the National Academy of Science, and the National Institutes of Health Committees concerned with animal health issues. During her career, Beth worked on diseases affecting a host of wildlife species in the West. In 1980, Beth married Tom Thorne, and in 1982, she joined the Department of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Wyoming, beginning one of the most productive husband and wife collaborations in the history of American conservation. Tom Thorne earned a bachelor's degree in zoology and DVM at Oklahoma State University. In 1968, he started work as a wildlife veterinarian with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, where he researched brucellosis in elk and bison, a disease that threatened the economy and ecological integrity of western Wyoming. As a prominent expert on brucellosis, tuberculosis, chronic wasting disease, and many other wildlife health issues, he worked on diseases in most of Wyoming's big game animals and edited and co-wrote Diseases of Wildlife in Wyoming, one of the most indispensable texts for wildlife veterinarians in the West. Tom was respected internationally, was a sought-after speaker, and received numerous awards. He was also deeply involved with a variety of wildlife organizations. In 1983, Thorne supervised the difficult effort to return black-footed ferrets to the wild, and later supervised the captive breeding program that saved the rare Wyoming toad from extinction. With his wife, Beth, Tom worked tirelessly to solve the problems of disease in game animals and other wildlife. If there was a sick animal anywhere in the Rocky Mountain West, the chances were good that Tom and Beth were trying to make it well.